Cancer is one of the most feared diseases all across the world, for good reason. Here in the United States, according to the CDC, one in two men will be diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime, and for women, it's currently one in three women. The conventional belief around cancer is that it's a genetic disease. Either you got the cancer genes, which is bad luck, or you don't, essentially good luck. But there's a huge issue with this flaw. It doesn't consider something called epigenetics. Research shows that cancer is not a genetic disease, it's a metabolic disease. Now, I don't claim to be a cancer expert or an oncologist, but I will say this. I've spent the last 17 years in the health and wellness space. I'm a researcher, and I've interviewed some of the brightest cancer researchers and oncologists and functional doctors in the world on my Metabolic Freedom podcast. So I dug into the research, and I identified seven of the best foods to starve cancer lower inflammation, and prevent a cancer diagnosis. I'll review all seven foods today on today's lesson. Before I do, it's important to understand how cancer is a metabolic disease and not a genetic disease. Dr. Thomas Seafried, who's a professor at Boston College, he's a world-renowned cancer researcher. He's taken the work of a gentleman named Otto Warburg, Dr. Warburg, from the 1930s, and they've shown since the 1930s, and especially in this day and age, that cancer is a metabolic disease. Allow me to explain how. Their research has proven that cancer is driven primarily as a metabolic disease from dysfunction and cellular energy production. This idea builds from Dr. Otto Warburg, suggesting that cancer originates from damage to the mitochondria, which impairs their ability to produce energy efficiently through oxidative phosphorylation. As a result, these cancer cells rely heavily on fermentation, a less efficient energy process that occurs in the cell. Seafried argues that these genetic mutations observed in cancer are secondary to this metabolic dysfunction, not the primary cause. He advocates for therapies that targets cancer's altered metabolism, such as ketosis and other interventions that limit glucose availability and elevate ketones, which cancer cells cannot use efficiently for energy. Back to this gentleman, Otto Warburg. He coined the term, the Warburg effect. Describing a phenomenon where cancer cells predominantly generate energy through aerobic glycolysis, fermentation, even in the presence of oxygen, which would normally allow cells to use the more efficient oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria. In this process, cancer cells take up large amounts of glucose and convert it into lactate, producing energy quickly but inefficiently. This reliance on glycolysis is the hallmark of cancer metabolism and is thought to be a survival mechanism for cells with damaged mitochondria. So the foods I'm about to share with you have two primary benefits as it relates to starving cancer cells. The first benefit is that it lowers your blood sugar and insulin levels. And by doing so, the second benefit, it lowers inflammation. Both high levels of blood sugar and high levels of insulin contribute to cancer growth. And inflammation is also at play here. That's because insulin is an energy sensor that signals growth. Now, for a growing child, that is terrific. The child could grow up to be a healthy adult. In an adult human being, that growth, when it is elevated and in excess, meaning insulin is elevated, could grow precancerous cells to grow into cancerous cells. When this happens, inflammation is increased around the cell, the cell membrane, the mitochondria, and the mitochondrial membrane. So the name of the game, lower inflammation by lowering insulin. Now, why is insulin elevated? It elevates when we have high levels of blood sugar in the body. What raises high blood sugar in the body primarily are carbohydrates. When we look at the three macronutrients out there, carbohydrates, protein, and fat, take a look at this graph. It is the carbohydrates by far that will get you the highest blood insulin response after you eat the food of carbohydrates. Now, of course, processed carbohydrates will get you a higher blood sugar and insulin response than whole food carbohydrates. But if you look at the protein, and the fat, there's not much of an insulin response. So the foods I'm about to share with you all are aligned to give you a low insulin and low blood sugar response after you eat them. And they lower inflammation at the same time. Just to make the point even further here before I give you the foods, this is why individuals who have type two diabetes, which is categorized as high insulin and high blood sugar levels, are at higher risk of developing cancer than individuals without 
diabetes. As a matter of fact, the research suggests that diabetics are 20 to 30% more likely to have cancer than non-diabetics. One of the markers you could test for is your hemoglobin A1C, which is the three month average of your blood sugar levels. If that's at 6.4% or higher, you're considered type two diabetic or diabetic. And a study has shown that if your levels of A1C are at 7.5% or higher every year, it's at that level, you lose 100 days off your lifespan. So if it's at that level for 15 years, you lose four years off your lifespan. That's how destructive high levels of blood sugar and insulin are inside of your body. With that being said, let's get to the seven foods. The first food, it's gonna surprise you, but it's grass-fed red meat. That red meat could come from beef or lamb. Grass-fed red meat have anti-inflammatory properties. There's a higher concentration of omega-3 fatty acids in grass-fed meat compared to grain-fed meat. Omega-3s are known for their anti-inflammatory effects and can help balance the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, which is critical for reducing inflammation. Too many people, especially those who are at risk of cancer, have a high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. This imbalance can trigger inflammation and disease. Red meat contains a high amount of conjugated linoleic acid called CLA. Grass-fed meat is loaded with CLA, which is a type of fatty acid that has been shown to have anti-inflammatory properties. CLA has also been linked to improve body composition and reduce markers of inflammation in the body. Eating red meat supports insulin sensitivity. Red meat is a high quality source of protein and fat and we just established that protein and fat barely touch the dial on insulin. There's a small response. Grass-fed meat is also loaded with vitamins and minerals such as zinc, vitamin D, and magnesium, all of which are critical for maintaining healthy insulin function and regulating blood sugar levels. Zinc, for example, plays a role in insulin signaling pathways, while magnesium helps to improve insulin sensitivity. Grass-fed meat is loaded with monounsaturated fats with a beneficial fat called oleic acid, also found in olive oil, which has been shown through research to improve insulin sensitivity. Grass-fed meat is also loaded with antioxidants. It is higher in vitamin E, glutathione, which help combat oxidative stress and reduce inflammation at the cellular level. Grass-fed beef is loaded with B vitamins, such as B12, niacin, and riboflavin, which are essential for energy metabolism, reducing inflammation, and supporting overall metabolic health. Grass-fed meat is also absent of hormones and antibiotics that you might found in grain-finished or grain-fed meat. When you consume grain-fed animals, it can contribute to imbalances in gut health and hormone regulation in humans because of the antibiotics and the poor diet that the cows are fed. So add red meat to your diet to lower inflammation, lower insulin, burn fat, and reduce risk of disease. It's kind of the opposite of what you've been told about red meat. Red meat is not linked to cancer. It is not the burger that causes the cancer. It's the bun that the burger is in, the carbohydrates. The second food you want to consume is fatty fish. The smaller the fish, the better, because the smaller the fish, the less toxins are stored. The bigger the fish, like tuna, swordfish, and other big fish, the more toxins that are accumulated. So we want small fatty fish. Here's why. Small fatty fish are loaded with omega-3 fatty acids, specifically EPA and DHA. These omega-3s are known for their potent anti-inflammatory properties. They reduce inflammation by competing with omega-6 fatty acids in the body, which tend to promote in inflammation when they're at an imbalance of omega-6 to omega-3, and it reduces the production of pro-inflammatory molecules like cytokines. The high content of omega-3 fatty acids in small fatty fish have been shown to improve insulin sensitivity. Studies indicate that a diet rich in omega-3s can enhance the body's ability to respond to insulin, leading to better blood sugar control. This is especially important for those who are pre-diabetic or diabetic. The healthy fats in fatty fish slow down digestion and the absorption of glucose, which prevent high blood sugar spikes and support more stable insulin levels. Small fatty fish are one of the best natural sources for vitamin D, which is an important vitamin and steroid hormone, which plays an important role in immune function and reducing inflammation. Your immune system is part of the defense system against cancer and rogue cells. So we wanna support the immune system by increasing our vitamin D levels and fatty fish will help you achieve that. Fatty fish is also loaded with B vitamins, with, which help with stress and oxidation and inflammation. And fatty fish is loaded with selenium, a powerful antioxidant that supports metabolic health by protecting cells from oxidative stress. Small fatty fish also contain astaxanthin, a 
very powerful antioxidant that provides anti-inflammatory benefits and prevents you from getting sunburned, which prevents skin cancer. So when it comes to fatty fish, here is a list of the ones you wanna consume. It is the SMASH acronym. That's going to be sardines, mackerel, anchovies, salmon, and herring. Those are the best fatty fish to consume. The next food you wanna consume are eggs with the yolk. There are a lot of benefits to eggs with the yolk, but one of the surprising benefits, especially as it relates to mitochondrial health and cancer prevention, is the melatonin and sleep regulation benefits from eggs. Eggs are a great source of tryptophan, an essential amino acid that serves as a precursor for both serotonin and melatonin. When we think about the mitochondria, we established at the beginning of this lesson that that is the key to preventing cancer, having healthy mitochondria. And when you have mitochondrial dysfunction, it can trigger cancer growth. Well, melatonin is the most powerful antioxidant for the mitochondria. When you consume eggs with the yolk and increase neurotransmitters like serotonin, that regulates mood and sleep, and it helps to convert into melatonin. Eggs are anti-inflammatory, from the B vitamins it contains, the omega-3 fatty acids that it has as well. Eggs are naturally low in carbohydrates, making them an excellent choice for those looking to stabilize blood sugar and insulin levels. But what about cholesterol? Will eggs raise my cholesterol? Will I prevent cancer but increase my risk of heart disease by eating eggs? The answer is no, you will not. You actually will reduce risk of cancer and heart disease by eating eggs. Total cholesterol is meaningless on your lab report. We wanna look at HDL, LDL, triglycerides, inflammatory markers. Eating quality eggs with the yolk will actually raise HDL. It might raise your total cholesterol. It might even raise your total LDL, but the particle sizes of the LDL need to be considered here. The small sticky pattern B of LDL is inflammatory, leading to heart disease. The large fluffy pattern A LDL is anti-inflammatory and really important for your immune system. When you eat eggs, it's the pattern A, large and fluffy, that increases, which builds your immune system and reduces risk of heart disease. So it's the opposite of what people think when we think about cholesterol. The next food on the list here is extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil contains a high concentration of polyphenols, such as olorapine and hydroxytyrosol, which are really powerful antioxidants. These compounds help to protect cells from oxidative stress and DNA damage which are key factors in cancer development. Another powerful antioxidant in olive oil are oleocanthals, which have been shown through research to be anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer. Research indicates that oleocanthals can induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death in cancer cells without harming healthy cells. This is particularly important in preventing the growth and spread of tumors. Olive oil is also rich in vitamin E, a fat-soluble antioxidant that helps neutralize free radicals and reduces oxidative stress, especially at the cell membrane level. When you consume extra virgin olive oil, it dramatically lowers your inflammatory levels. It does this largely due to the polyphenols in the healthy fats in olive oil. Regular consumption of extra virgin olive oil reduced levels of pro-inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein and interleukin-6, which are both linked to cancer progression. Olive oil has been shown to influence the expression of genes involved in cancer cell proliferation. The phenolic compounds in olive oil can inhibit cancer tumor angiogenesis, which is the process by which new blood cells form to supply nutrients to a tumor, and it reduces its ability of cancer cells to metastasize or spread to other parts of the body. There's also anti-diabetic properties found in olive oil. I shared earlier, diabetes, diabetics have a 20 to 30% more chance increase of getting cancer than non-diabetics. Well, the monounsaturated fats in extra virgin olive oil, particularly the oleic acid, improves insulin sensitivity. It's been shown to support healthy cell membranes and improving the cell's ability to respond to insulin and transport glucose more efficiently and effectively. Olive oil supports in weight loss as well. It improves the feeling of fullness due to its fat content, which can aid in weight management. Maintaining a healthy weight is crucial for preventing cancer, diabetes, obesity, and consuming extra virgin olive oil is one of the best ways to burn excess fat. You want to make sure your olive oil is a high quality olive oil that's in a dark glass bottle that has not been cut with the seed oil and they do first harvest pressed and it's organic. I personally use the Fresh Pressed Olive Oil Club. You could get a $39 bottle of the Fresh Pressed Olive Oil 
olive oil for just $1 by going to ketocampoliveoil.com. I'll drop that link down below. The next food to add here to your list are avocados. The primary fat in avocados is oleic acid, a monounsaturated fat that is also found in the olive oil that we just shared. Oleic acid has been shown to reduce inflammation by decreasing the production in inflammatory molecules like C-reactive protein and interleukin-6. Avocados are loaded with vitamin E, carotenoids, lutein, zeaxanthin. These are antioxidants that help neutralize free radicals, reducing oxidative stress and inflammation. We know that chronic inflammation leads to heart disease, arthritis, diabetes, and cancer. Avocados help boost glutathione levels a very powerful antioxidant within your body. We mentioned that melatonin is the mitochondria's most important antioxidant, and the only other antioxidant that the mitochondria could use is glutathione. When you have adequate levels of glutathione, buffers stress, buffers inflammation, and neutralizes free radicals. Avocados are loaded with healthy fats and has a good fiber content, which helps to manage blood sugar levels, lower insulin levels, and helps you burn body fat as well all very important when we think about cancer development. Some studies even suggest that phytochemicals in avocados, particularly avocotin B, help to reduce the growth of cancer cells. Avocados contain compounds that may inhibit the proliferation of certain cancer cells, particularly in prostate and oral cancers. The antioxidants and anti-inflammatory effects of avocados can help protect against DNA damage, reducing the risk of mutations that lead to cancer. The next food on the list here is actually a drink, and it's green tea. Green tea has been consumed for centuries due to its numerous health benefits, particularly its anti-inflammatory and anti-cancer benefits. These benefits are largely attributed to the high concentration of polyphenols, especially the catechins, with EGCG being the most potent and well-studied. The EGCG found in green tea helps to neutralize free radicals that contribute to oxidative stress, one of the key drivers of chronic inflammation in the body. Green tea also contains flavonoids and other antioxidants, which further help to reduce inflammation. These compounds can protect cells from damage by reducing the activity of inflammatory enzymes and cytokines, such as tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNFA, and interleukin-6, which is also called IL-6. The EGCG in green tea can induce apoptosis, which is programmed cell death, in cancer cells without affecting healthy cells. That's pretty cool. It works by disrupting cancer cell proliferation and inducing cell cycle arrest. EGCG has been found to target pathways that promote uncontrolled cell division, thereby slowing or halting tumor growth. The EGCG also can inhibit angiogenesis, the process by which new blood vessels are formed to supply nutrients to tumors. By preventing angiogenesis, green tea may starve tumors of the necessary blood supply, slowing their growth and spread. EGCG has been shown to reduce the ability of cancer cells to metastasize, to spread to other parts of the body. It achieves this by inhibiting the enzymes that degrade extracellular matrix components, which cancer cells need to invade surrounding tissues and metastasize to distant organs. Green tea has another benefit that helps with cancer prevention, and that is fat oxidation and weight loss. Especially when you time green tea around exercise, it has actually been shown the EGCG and the catechins to lower visceral fat in your body and support healthy weight loss. It does this by reducing excess fat, especially the white visceral fat around your organs, which lowers chronic inflammation, improves insulin sensitivity, and at the end of the day, further reducing your cancer risk. The seventh and final food is actually not a food. It is not eating. And that what I mean by that is intermittent fasting, having an eating window and having a fasting window. That could look different for everybody. I like a good 18-6 daily schedule where for 18 hours you're fasted, only having water, coffee, green tea, but no food, and then a six-hour eating window. When you get into a fasted state, you enhance a process called autophagy. This is so important when it comes to health and longevity and cancer prevention. The definition of autophagy by the Greeks is eat thyself. What this means is when you're in a fasted state, you're not getting food energy. So your innate intelligence, that inner physician thinks, where are we going to get our energy from? We're hardwired to believe a famine is right around the corner. Even though consciously we could be aware that we could just walk to the refrigerator or order Uber Eats, the metabolism and the innate intelligence doesn't understand that we're hardwired for the old school. So it ramps up a process called autophagy where it literally starts to eat thyself. It's like Pac-Man looking 
for precancerous cells, in cancerous cells and gobbling it up, eating it for fuel, maybe even going a step farther and activating apoptosis program cell death and then creating a new stem cell that is not precancerous, that is not cancerous. And all this happens during a fast. So if you did an 18 hour fast, you should achieve a few hours of autophagy uh, by the point of breaking the fast. And then during your six hour eating window, you wanna eat the previous six foods that I outlined earlier in this lesson. Now let's get to some of the most common questions I get asked when I talk about this topic of foods that prevent cancer. The first question is this, will eating these foods put me in ketosis and would this help with cancer prevention? The answer is yes, these foods should get you into ketosis, especially if you're not pairing them with high carbohydrates. For most people, if you keep your total carbohydrates under 50 grams per day, you should enter ketosis. Ketosis is very important for cancer prevention and in some cases even reverse cancer. Ketones and fatty acids are really important fuels for the body, for the brain. We know that cancer could feed off of sugar, but there's not one primary cancer that can feed off of fatty acids and ketones, making it a powerful fuel source for healthy cells and to starve cancer cells. When you're in ketosis, your cells produce more energy. Your mitochondria produce more ATP. It also raises glutathione in your body, lowering inflammation, lowering insulin, lowering blood sugar levels. It's one of the most important tools in the shed for cancer prevention, for fat loss, and for restoring your metabolism. So yes, these foods that I all outlined are all keto friendly. They're all healthy and clean. If you consume them and keep your total carbohydrates under 50 grams total per day, you will be in a state of ketosis. You could always test that by pricking your blood with like a, a device like a Keto Mojo. And if it shows 0.5 or higher on a ketone blood finger prick device, you're in a state of ketosis that's looking at millimoles per liter. The next question is, what role does emotional stress play with cancer development? The truth is this, there's not one thing that contributes to cancer, it's multifactorial. The foods that I outlined today and the intermittent fasting that I spoke about are all gonna be helpful, but you wanna also consider other factors like emotional stress. And there's not one thing that's going to be the only thing that causes cancer, but I remember when I interviewed Dr. Erin Keneally, who's a world famous cancer doctor out of California. I've interviewed her twice on my Metabolic Freedom podcast and I said, Dr. Keneally, I know that cancer is multifactorial. There are multiple things that lead to cancer growth. But if you had to choose one, what would be the leading cause of cancer growth based off of your, I think, 25 years of research and thousands, tens of thousands of patients that she's worked with with cancer? What would be the leading cause? You know what she said? Trapped emotions. So yes, emotional stress is a leading contributor to cancer development. So definitely master your stress. Go study people like Dr. Wayne Dyer, Bob Proctor, and others to help to get the mindset right. I'm a big advocate of reading these self-development books and it'll help with everything else that we're talking about today. Next question is, what are the best blood work markers to assess my risk of cancer? We mentioned a few earlier, that's gonna be an inflammatory marker called high sensitivity C-reactive protein, HSCRP. That's a good one. Fasting insulin, great test. Well, let's go back a second. Your HSCRP should be 1.0 or below. The fasting insulin should be in the single digits. Two to five is optimal, but anything in the single digits is great. That's a blood test, just like the C-reactive protein. Then we have your A1C. As I mentioned earlier, a three-month average of your blood sugar levels, you want that at 5.2% or lower. Homocysteine, a great inflammatory marker you want as well in the single digits. There are a lot more specific cancer markers. Those are, the ones I mentioned are more accessible and you could request them from your doctor and they're all affordable if you have to pay out of pocket. The next question is, can a longer fast prevent or reverse cancer? Three days, seven days, or even longer? The answer is uh, yes, it probably will help you prevent cancer or even in some cases reverse it. Now I can't definitively say it will, but I have seen through some students with longer fasts, five days, seven days, some miraculous things happen. I'll give you a, a crazy example. My mentor, Dr. Daniel Pampa, in 1995, he was sharing a story with me. In 1995, he had a patient that came into his office with a cancerous tumor that was the size of a grapefruit. She went through every conventional path and they only could do so much for her. She lost hope with the conventional therapies and treatments out there. So she didn't know what to do and she was desperate. So she entered Dr. Pompa's clinic and he told her to fast. And she did, I believe it was a 14 day fast where she just had water. And that tumor went from a grapefruit 
to a golf ball and then she did a few more fast and eventually it disappeared. Right now, this is anecdotal and it's not gonna happen for everybody, but when you go into a longer fast, you really enhance that autophagy process where you start crushing bad cells. Remember the Pac-Man going through your body, crushing those fat cells. And as a matter of fact, I just released a brand new interview, a deep dive into cancer, into how ketosis and fasting and longer fast help to prevent and reverse cancer with one of the world leaders on cancer research, Dr. Thomas Seafried. So I recommend you watch that video next. The most minimal level of exercise will put you at risk for cancer. The worst kind of foods, you have to eat large amounts of highly processed foods. If you're eating a lot, a lot of highly processed foods and not exercising, you can put the risk of getting diabetes and obesity. So uh, you put it all together, cancer is exploding in our societies 